We're 30 miles from the nearest land, 25 feet underwater, trying to establish contact with a school of dolphins I've known for more than 20 years. Using a computer especially designed to work underwater, we're broadcasting dolphin sounds into an apparently empty ocean. It appears to be a fool's errand, but the sounds are answered. This is the continuation of a conversation begun 20 years earlier, when Hardy Jones and Julia Whitty first came to the Bahamas with a primitive computer, attempting to entice a group of spotted dolphins to their cameras. I couldn't have imagined when I first set out on this quest to meet dolphins in the open sea that the work would take up the rest of my life. Not only did I find friendly dolphins in the Bahamas, but their discovery led me to seek out other species around the world, from bottlenose dolphins in French Polynesia to killer whales in the Arctic. Julia Witte, trained as a biologist, faced a unique challenge when confronted with animals as curious about her as she was about them. I quickly found I couldn't study dolphins the way I'd studied other animals. The dolphins demanded interaction with us or they'd leave. And that presented a new kind of problem, how to keep them interested without influencing their behavior. One dolphin emerged from the group as astonishingly friendly and curious. We called him Chopper. He'd swim with us nearly every day, and we've had the privilege of literally watching him grow up. Today, Hardy Jones uses film and the internet to inform and educate people to the unique world of dolphins and the environment they live in. Though Hardy's work takes him around the world, he still returns to the Bahamas nearly every summer, especially to see Chopper. When first setting out, Hardy and Julia planned to stay a single summer, and the title they had in mind for their film was A Year with the Dolphins. Little did they know. In the late 1970s, the idea of swimming with dolphins in the wild was the stuff of myths. In those days, whales and dolphins were still being killed by the thousands. My idea was that if I could capture the lives of free swimming dolphins on film, depicting their curiosity and friendliness towards humans, that it would help stop the ghastly slaughters of dolphins that were taking place in the tuna fishery and in places like Japan. The effort started when Hardy learned of a place north of Grand Bahama Island, where a treasure diver had been swimming with a school of dolphins for more than a decade. These were spotted dolphins, a typically shy species that occurs in tropical oceans around the world. But in this one location, they were reported to be uniquely friendly. In 1979, Hardy got together a team of underwater cameramen and sound engineers to join him on the quest. During their early searches for the dolphins, they patrolled the western edge of the Little Bahama Banks, staring at a very empty sea. But they were not disappointed. I'll never forget the excitement of those first encounters. The dolphins raced in to see us, swirled around, sonaring wildly. After a while, they slowed down to examine us intently with their eyes. There was a tremendous sense of discovery and exhilaration. They just, they thought it was, uh, it was toy time or something. They had something new to play with. It was incredible. I was trying to use it to, as a bridge, you know, to see if I could get them to come to the fin 
and then come, come further. But then the dolphins were gone, and we could not find them again. During our first two years, we found the dolphins only twice. One of the first things we learned as we returned to the Bahamas year after year was that we wouldn't find the dolphins, they'd find us. We learned we could identify individual members of the school by body markings, and in one case by a remora, or suckerfish, which to our amazement stayed with one particular female for six years. She was so curious and friendly that she began to get a reputation as a camera hog. The dolphin with a remora was accompanied by rambunctious younger dolphins, including the male who was missing the tip of his dorsal fin, the one they come to call Chopper. The team had decided from the first that they would never tag or feed the dolphins. All interactions would be on a voluntary basis. Those were heady days. We were getting to know a school of dolphins in the wild but there were some who took objection to our treating the dolphins as individuals. After we did our initial reports on our work in the Bahamas, there was a lot of skepticism about what we were doing because we were giving names to dolphins, we were dealing with them as individuals. This was kind of uh, upsetting to some in the scientific community. They, they thought we should give them numbers to deliberately keep ourselves remote from them. The work Hardy and Julia did in the early 1980s showed that dolphins did not need to be in captivity to be studied. Long-term research could be carried out underwater in the wild with free dolphins. The principal problem was that while the dolphins would arrive with great enthusiasm, they would depart just as suddenly, and the team would be left with long days in the hot sun waiting. On one of these mornings with little to do, the captain ran the outboard just for fun, and the dolphins immediately showed up. It gave us a first clue about what we needed to do to attract them, and it wasn't long before they were hanging out waiting for some action from this new toy. A second breakthrough came when I dropped my swim fin to test how the dolphins would react. The results were astonishing. The dolphins came in, sonaring the fin, circling, and ultimately touching it. This is the same way they respond to anything new in their environment. First, as they approach, they sweep their heads back and forth, sonaring. When very close, they examine with their eyes. You can feel the sonar directed at you, resonating through your body, especially in your chest and sinuses. Dolphin sonar ignores water so it can penetrate body tissues and literally see inside other animals a form of x-ray vision. Because visibility in the sea rarely exceeds 100 feet, this sonar also enables them to detect distant objects, such as a shark from a quarter of a mile away. Using their jaw bones as receivers, the dolphins pass sound signals to their brains, where they are transformed into three-dimensional imagery. So when I took off my fin, I knew they could easily discern the difference between the rubber and my body. But I hoped that pulling off the fin would make them curious, and it did.
As we spent time with the dolphins, we began to recognize their individual signature whistles. We named the female with a remora Didi because she always approached us making the same up-down whistle. While making these signature whistles, the dolphins emit a stream of bubbles from their blowholes, so it's easy to spot which animal is identifying itself. Dee was a constant companion of Chopper, the young dolphin with the blunted dorsal fin. During the first encounter in 1979, his skin was a pearly gray with no spotting at all, indicating he was less than two years old. By the third year, he had begun to develop some spotting. Between the ages of three and five, he was often seen with a younger sibling, perhaps acting as a babysitter. As he reached adulthood, he began to form alliances with other males. With each passing year, Chopper developed more spots, but the unique dorsal fin made him always identifiable. I'm not certain how old Chopper was when we first encountered him, since no human had observed his birth, but he was certainly in the first year of his life. Indeed, no one had ever observed the birth of a dolphin in the open sea, and it took me 20 years before I even came close to witnessing such a remarkable event. In June of the year 2000, the team departed West End on Grand Bahama and made their way north to test a new computerized dolphin communication system. It was the first trip out here for John Ross, computer designer and sound engineer. John had designed a computer built into an underwater housing, which he and Hardy hoped would attract the dolphins. The computer is controlled by a magnet, which acts in place of the more familiar mouse. So, uh, so we've just slipped that in there. The actual, you know, a little bit too hard to hold on to, so if we can insert it in the glove, it makes it much easier. So I can just do the basic cursor movements with the mouse, and my click and drag and enter, <clears throat> so I can navigate around the screen here and move the mouse in any particular location and since it's, since it's picture oriented and menu driven, you can pretty much do almost all the controls of your software just from the mouse. At first, bringing a computer in the water may seem preposterous, but it makes sense. The dolphins are primarily acoustical creatures. And so to interest them, we developed a computer that would not only replay sounds, but record sounds in real time and play them back to the dolphins. We can also manipulate the sounds, altering them in a variety of ways to interest the dolphins. We did not believe that we'd be able to communicate with the dolphins as one human talks to another, but we did hope we could show the dolphins that we were interested in them. And at the very least, the computer should attract the dolphins and make it easier to film them. But to do this, we needed dolphins. Instead, we got a rather large barracuda who seemed genuinely interested in the sounds John was making. So interested, in fact, that John refused to play further. It's no mystery that finding the dolphins on any given day is difficult. Their home range covers over 100 square miles, including the coral reefs on the edge of the Gulf Stream and the sugar white sands on the Little Bahama Banks. In this featureless zone, the occasional shipwreck becomes an oasis for fish and a landmark for dolphins. Here, they share their world with great shoals of barracuda, with eagle rays, and even the occasional manta. The spotted dolphins spend the daytime hours over the white sand, a habitat vital to their survival. This fact was vividly illustrated to me in 1985 
during the single most extraordinary experience I've ever had with the spotted dolphins. I was swimming with a small group when a very large Atlantic hammerhead shark came up over the edge of the reef onto the white sand ridge. I needed to breathe, and when I went to the surface, the shark followed. Some of the dolphins seemed to desert me. I didn't want to be caught with my legs dangling, so I dove down a few feet and started filming. Then the most remarkable thing happened. Here is the footage exactly as I shot it. Chopper swam under my left arm and made straight for the shark. Two other juveniles came in and mobbed the now confused hammerhead. There's no question in my mind that those dolphins intervened to protect me. Once the hammerhead was gone, the dolphins resumed play amongst themselves. Because the dolphins feed mostly at night out in the deep waters of the Gulf Stream, they need to find somewhere safe to rest during the daylight hours. Over the white sand, they can shut off their sonar, enabling that vital part of their brains to rest. while their eyes take over the important business of keeping watch. Against deep water or a reef, sharks are difficult to see. But over white sand, they stand out clearly. Seeing that hammerhead come at me and the dolphin's response to it, is what led me to believe that the white sand habitat is critical to the dolphin's survival, especially during their daytime resting hours. Another extraordinary encounter one morning during the summer of 2000 showed me further reason why the white sand is critical to the dolphin's survival. A few youngsters arrived on the bow. A larger group of dolphins appeared in the distance but they seemed unusually preoccupied with their own activities and did not race to the bow as usual. The juveniles, while staying close to the main group of dolphins, played amongst themselves, but the densest concentration was made up of adults. Those are dolphins that we, we sometimes call the heavies. They, they're the large male groups, heavily spotted, and they cluster together. It's, somewhat, it sometimes can be a defensive formation. With the dolphins swimming quietly around our boat, we finally had a real chance to test the computerized dolphin communicator. Several of the juveniles made quick passes, but surprised me by moving on quickly. My eyes strained to spot Chopper, but the water was so murky I could only see dolphins within 15 feet. These younger dolphins were more interested in grabbing tasty snacks from the bottom than in our computer. Sonaring loudly, they moved over the bottom like hound dogs on the scent. Once they spotted a fish, they would snap it up with an audible clacking of their jaws. It's clear their sonar can penetrate the sand and discover small fish in their burrows, proving they will use their versatile sonar in the daytime if they didn't get enough to eat the night before. Even after two hours of contact, the dolphins continued to show virtually no interest in the computer-generated sounds and paid no attention to us personally. But they didn't try to avoid us either. I'd never seen anything like this before. When I did get close to the main school, I saw the dolphins were tightly packed into a very defensive formation, even though there was no evident source of danger. Staring through the murky water, I tried to decipher what was going on. 
Finally, my eyes focused on what was happening. At the core of the formation was a single, very pregnant female. She was surrounded by her pod mates pressing against her, forming a barrier of dolphin bodies against any intruder. It's my belief that we were witnessing a gathering of dolphins to protect a female about to give birth. I never saw the birth itself because several dolphins began showing signs of displeasure. They swam quickly past us, giving a series of barks, which we know to be a sign of anger or aggression. We took the hint and headed back to the boat. As I waited to be picked up, a large male dolphin swam over. At first I thought we were in for another warning, but then I saw this was an old friend, Nachi, a dolphin I hadn't seen for 10 years. Here is a shot of Nachi in 1989, clearly showing his injury. I believe it was probably from a boat propeller. I was delighted to see he was still alive. The spine of a dolphin is deeper within its body than in a human, but I think this dolphin had a very close call. Nachi was curious and playful from the first. He had a companion who was a little older and the two of them played together and with us for more than an hour during the summer of 1989. I tried to join their games by scratching along the bottom with my hand. This brought the two of them rocketing back at me. Then they'd shoot off and grab a bite from the sand and race back to play. And I remember that when time came for him to leave, obeying some call from the senior members of the pod, Nachi hesitated, looking back for an instant. Then he was gone, and I would not meet him again for more than a decade. But as I returned to the boat that morning during the summer of 2000, the spectacular gathering of dolphins seemed to increase. Although they'd ignored us and the dolphin communicator while we were in the water, now there were some 70 dolphins clustered around the bow. From the surface, the core group of dolphins looked almost like a single organism. And that may have been their intent, to present a predator with a formidable looking defense. This is the most relaxed experience I think I've ever had with them. And it is clearly the largest group of spotted dolphins certainly that we've ever had up here. It's my belief that the entire dolphin population of the White Sand Ridge had gathered for a birth. They had come onto the White Sand, away from the Gulf Stream, where they knew they'd be safe from sharks during the most vulnerable moment in the life of a mother and her newborn calf. We ran with the dolphins at low speed until 4 p.m. We'd had 70 dolphins for eight hours, and then the ocean was empty. The dolphins disappeared in an instant, and we did not see them again. After the first eight years out on the banks, Hardy and Julia had identified a large number of individual dolphins and were plotting their social relationships. Year after year, the catalog of dolphin IDs grew. Though at first, the movement of the dolphin school appeared chaotic, gradually patterns began to emerge. While the spotted dolphins may occasionally gather in large groups, they normally are found in subgroups. Females and young calves form one of these. Young males play together until they're ready to join the senior male coalitions. Young females tend to stay with the mothers and calves. 
helping out as babysitters. The affection dolphins have for one another was clear to us from the start. They're constantly touching each other, rubbing their pectoral fins and flukes together. Affection, even love, is a form of social bonding that ensures these dolphins will take care of one another. Because they live in a world where sharks are always present, dolphins are vulnerable, and any dolphin separated from the pod is in severe danger. I was with a group of mothers and calves one day when an aggressive shark swam down over the sand. The dolphins instantly moved into a protective formation with the adult females on the outside. Little ones who'd been playing on the perimeter were rounded up by nearby adults. A male becoming aware of the threat gave an alarm whistle. Other males raced to join him, and they united into a large force, moving rapidly to defend the females and calves. One look at this formidable coalition, and the shark skulked back into the blue. Back in 1981, the team first began working with a primitive version of a computerized dolphin communication system, hoping to attract the dolphins to the cameras and to see if some kind of dialogue could be established. This early design recognized that dolphins vocalize at very high frequencies, allowing transmission of huge amounts of information in very short periods, something like a computer modem. Sound engineer Steve Gagné developed two systems to deal with this. One, a tape recorder, that would allow them to capture the sounds of the dolphins in real time, but to hear the sounds at reduced speeds within the human hearing range. The second device, a synthesizer, Steve had programmed with real dolphin calls from the previous year. Dee Dee's signature whistle, for instance, which he could then play back to the dolphins. How about if we assign one call to be like my identity sound, and I'll play that call whenever I operate the box, and we'll make one call your identity. They had no idea how the dolphins would respond to the synthesizer, if at all. When we first entered the water, we felt a little foolish, standing on the bottom with these two plastic boxes in our hands. But the dolphin's response was immediate. Chopper and Dee Dee, with some of their buddies, came over to take a puzzled look. This was the first time we'd ever made sounds in the dolphin's frequency range. We knew something was happening when a dolphin called Big Eye began to descend tail first from the surface. This was a very deliberate act and not a normal way for a dolphin to swim. But it was the way Steve and I had descended, feet first. Steve let me have the headphones so I could hear the dolphins with the frequency step down. The results were amazing. Suddenly the dolphins' world came alive. It was as though I had been watching a symphony orchestra playing, but only now could hear the music.
big eye circled over to cameraman Howard Hall, who was lying on the sand filming. To our absolute amazement, this senior male lay down on the sand right in front of him, mimicking Howard's position. The entire time, Big Eye was imitating the sounds we were making with the call generator. He then swam back to Steve and me, who were standing on the bottom, and with great effort began to use his pectoral fins to bring himself into a vertical position on the sand. We were astounded by his actions. Big Eye was standing in front of us, mimicking both the motions of our bodies and the output from the computer. I was going with the machine, let's say. Yeah. And I'd do that maybe once or twice, and then the dolphins would go add something to it and there I was stuck like a dummy with only being able to push the box back and I felt like I want to generate something new on top of what they did because it was clearly an interaction. I can just as easily imagine that the dolphins are still questioning whether we're intelligent or not based on our inability to respond to. Them. Though this was a great success, I knew that to move the experiment further, we'd have to be able to replay and manipulate those sounds in real time. It would take nearly two decades before technology would give us the means to do this. The White Sand Ridge, where the dolphins live, is nearly 40 miles from land and offers no protection from the weather. Hurricanes are common in this area. But when one made an unexpected turn in our direction, we couldn't resist staying a little longer to see how the dolphins reacted. They loved it, surfing the waves and generally having a great time. I went in briefly to see what it was like. The dolphins were as excited as I'd ever seen them, positively thriving on the rough seas. For me, being in the water in those conditions was more like being in a washing machine than snorkeling. Yet here was Chopper, having the time of his life. But as the wind continued to build, we couldn't risk staying any longer and headed south to calmer waters, to the island of Bimini, about 80 miles from the White Sand Ridge. There, we could work closer to land. This also gave us a chance to see if there might be other friendly dolphins around. We decided to scout for schools of spotters in areas where currents and bottom contours were similar to the White Sand Ridge. As the weather cleared, we started our search just north of this fabled island. It was strange studying spotted dolphins for whom I had no history. I didn't know any of the individuals here, but the thought of getting to know a whole new school was exciting. The sand here is not nearly so white as up north, but it still provides quite a bit of contrast to help the dolphins avoid predators. One of the first identifications we made was of an adult female with much of her left pectoral fin missing. She closely resembled another female we'd identified in the north, but we'd need other data before this qualified as a match. Nevertheless, it raised the question of whether there's any connection between the Bimini spotters and those on the White Sand Ridge. We identified another dolphin which appeared to be scarred from fishing line that had once been wrapped around its tailstock. 
I'd seen this kind of injury on seals and sea lions before, but never on a dolphin. While we were able to gather only a handful of identifications here, we were excited to see that Atlantic spotted dolphins seem to be unusually friendly and curious towards humans. In the middle 1980s, Denise Herzing, a dedicated and talented scientist, began working on the White Sand Ridge, studying the dolphins Hardy and Julia had first filmed in 1978. She too was interested in a possible connection between the Bimini School and the Northern Group. On a recent visit to the White Sand Ridge, we hailed her vessel, Stanella. Ocean Explorers, Stanella, uh, 7-2. Go on, 7-2. Since 1985, Denise Herzing has maintained one of the longest continual studies of free-swimming marine mammals ever conducted. I could not interpret communication very well without knowing the players. And that's why we invest so much time in IDs, because you know, if you have five animals and they're interacting to interpret what's going on, it's nice to know, oh, that's the sibling of that one, or that's the calf of that one, or, you know, mother, or whatever, because then the behavior starts making more sense. Of course, one of the most interesting questions I had for Denise was whether she'd seen Chopper. We certainly saw that, do that particular dolphin when we came out here in 85. We'd seen his old shots on your, your film, so we knew he had been around certainly previously. It's been a real regular dolphin up here with us. We've seen him you know, grow up and we've been monitoring who he's associated with over the years. Um, and we've seen some changes that way. He's shifted alliances with his previous uh, male buddies. He's now hanging out with some of the what we call the southern uh, males a little more really? than his central group. Yeah. This work out here is actually some of the first that's ever been done in establishing how long these animals live in the wild. You know now for me out here for 15 years that you have to be at least 15 to reach that spot and probably older. Knowing dolphins as we do, Denise and I both agreed that their deaths in tuna nets or in other ways at the hands of humans is totally unacceptable. So far during this summer of 2000, the dolphins had shown little interest in our new computer, and John and I were discouraged. Now we were down to our final day on the water, just offshore Bimini. John prepped the computer in nearly 20 knots of wind. Dolphins appeared in the swells, and we wasted no time getting into the water. As this was our last day, I decided to take no chances. Knowing the dolphins loved to play, I brought an underwater scooter in with me, a toy they'd never been able to resist in the past. But the dolphins' attention quickly shifted from the scooter to the computer. Finally, they were responding, but there were so many dolphins and so much excitement that it was difficult to know whether they were reacting to the calls or just interested in all the action. In the midst of this melee, a bottlenose dolphin appeared, drawn in by the excitement. But the spotted dolphins were not pleased by his appearance. They swam aggressively, signaling one another, then flinging themselves against the intruder. The bottlenose launched himself repeatedly through the surface in his attempt to escape the spotters. But he was driven off, and the spotters seemed to do a little dance of self-congratulation. With the bottlenose dolphin out of the way, the spotter's attention swung back to the computer. They were incredibly excited. 
perhaps wondering at our newfound ability to communicate a sort of Delphinese. Finally, the pace slowed down enough that we could hear a back and forth exchange going on between the dolphins and the computer. Exhausted by the continual free diving, I went for a small scuba tank. Tony Milo, you. Yeah, you got it. Back in the water, I went for as many identifications as I could get, shooting short bursts of film at high speed. But the juveniles, as always, thought of it as just a game and took up positions as though they were bow riding my camera or engaged in the sex play, which takes up so much of the dolphin's free time. Got it. Well, that's some good ideas. Excellent. Recognize a couple of these guys. From 1989, where we have some good identifications just two miles north of here. And then from last November, I have some identifications that were done in this area too. And we can start to build up a real collection of the dolphins here and then start to match it with the dolphins that are further up north and the dolphins that are further down south. Then we could begin to establish really how broad the range is. There are times for putting aside science and technology and just being with the dolphins. One afternoon, Julia had a very special experience. I just decided to relate to the dolphins as fellow creatures rather than objects of study. I started making eye contact, and since there was no one else around, everything got very quiet. For humans, the desire to reach out and touch is innate. For a while, this dolphin remained tantalizingly out of reach. There's no question the dolphins were responding to my moves. When I dove, they did too. Later that same day, I did touch one of the dolphins for the first time, and then found them trying to lure me away from the boat out to sea. After that first moment of contact, the dolphins began swimming, pulling Julia along in their wake. She was skimming over the surface, not moving her flippers. It was as though the dolphins wanted to take her home with them. Over the years, I've always been careful touching the dolphins, but there was one occasion when I couldn't resist. A young female with a crescent shape out of her dorsal fin approached me and looked me in the eye. Her fin reminded me of choppers, but this was a young female, not my old friend. She moved her body in a manner that was clearly soliciting a rub. I felt it would be insulting not to oblige her. Indeed, she was so close that I could film her with one hand and touch her with the other. She swam with me like this for about 15 minutes before drifting off with a more hydrodynamic companion. After our first films on the dolphins of the White Sand Ridge, divers began to come from all over the world to share the experience of meeting free-swimming, friendly dolphins in the open sea. Here it's possible to relate to them, not doing circus tricks in a cement tank, but because they freely choose to associate with us.
What is happening in the Bahamas between spotted dolphins and humans was once unique. But today, the friendship between humans and dolphins, even humans and creatures such as killer whales, is expanding worldwide. In Tisfjord, Norway, this young female killer whale approached our boat and then swam with me for more than an hour. Her calf swam to within a couple of feet of me to investigate this strange creature. It reminded me of the early days when we'd first met Dee Dee and Chopper. In New Zealand, in Ireland, Australia, and French Polynesia, people come by the thousands for the privilege of meeting dolphins in the wild. Whales, too, are showing friendly behavior. It is impossible to guess at how far the relationship between the large-brained creatures of the land and those of the sea could ultimately go. It all began here, more than 20 years ago, in a remote area of the Bahamas, where we learned to play with these dolphins with any toys that came to hand. Whether it's a game of drop the t-shirt, a wind-up toy fish, or underwater scooters, their curiosity seems inexhaustible. Our computer work is only in the very first phase. In the future, we'll use the computer to analyze the sophisticated vocalizations the dolphins make in the context of their actions. We'll assign signature whistles to each member of our team, essentially naming ourselves in dolphin whistle language. At the very least, this says to the dolphins, we're interested in you. Ultimately, it may lead to a breakthrough between our two species, a first hint of communication with a non-terrestrial intelligence. And where is Chopper today? Fully grown, more than 20 years old, and in the prime of life. I hope people get to know him well, for he is all dolphins. Every dolphin who dies in a fishing net, or is killed by pollution, or overfishing, is a dolphin just like Chopper, Dee Dee, Nachi, and all the other dolphins of the White Sand Ridge. Our 20-year effort in the Bahamas is but a hint of what might develop between human beings and other large-brained creatures with whom we share our planet. This relationship is only the beginning.